Does anybody want to get into the Word today? All right. If you got a Bible, go ahead and get it out. Hello. And if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and get your app out. We're going to be in a wonderful book that excites so many of us in a minute. I will tell you what that book is in just a moment, but it'll have one of two reactions, and I like them both. So get your uh, notes out, get your Bibles open, and like Corey said, we're going to dive in today. I'm so glad you guys are here to join in this, and I think uh, if you're watching online or if you're in this room, this is a word for you. You're going to want to take notes today if you're the note-taking type, because we are going to be in the book of Revelation today. Oh, come on. Yeah, see, the one of the two reactions. Half of you scared out your mind. <laughs> the other of you are excited. You're like, oh, yeah. You're thinking revelation, end times, prophecy, things I don't understand, you know, all them things. Well, today, it's not end times. It's actually not that hard to understand, and it's something we actually all deal with, but we never like to really talk about. In the summertime, it seems that many of us like to take our foot off the gas a little bit, you know? We like to exert ourselves a little less, work a little less. We, we try a little less. And unfortunately, I think this carries over to our spiritual lives very often. It's summer and it's nice outside. There's things on our calendar that we want to do, and we have one more reason to not be in the Word one more reason to not be in church, one more reason to not be connected in relationship with other believers. And we take our cues from the world and we have fun and we do fun things that are not bad in and of themselves. We take time off, we go on vacations, we spend maybe more money than we should have all the while neglecting time with the Lord, time in his presence, time fulfilling his call on our lives. And all of a sudden, we look up, and a little bit of the flame is gone. A little bit of the passion that we used to have isn't there anymore. Where there used to be some energy, where there used to be a little bit of push, now there's lethargy, there's excuses. There is a lack of a drive to really do much of anything. And maybe we can't put our finger on exactly the one thing that it is, but we know something's off, and we know we're in a rut. And just like you can be in a physical rut, or an emotional rut, or even a relational rut, you can be in a spiritual rut. And it happens to so many of us, more than we'd really like to admit. But I've got some good news for you today. You don't have to stay in the rut. You can get out of the rut. Turn to somebody around you and say, you can get out. Yeah, turn to somebody else you're not so comfortable with and tell them you can get out. <laughs> you can get out of this rut. If you are in a rut today, I've got this good news because you don't have to stay there. We here are in the rut removal business. Let me tell you. We're going to get you out of that rut. We're in the business of seeing your spirit stirred up, of seeing your heart set ablaze again for the things of God, and you doing the things that actually are purposed for you, that give you the passion that burns inside of you when all that's in this world burns out. I'm telling you, we were about letting you step into the things of God and live from that place. Is anybody interested in that kind of thing? Well, if you're in a rut today, I'm telling you, at the end of this service, you're going to know how to get out of that rut. And of course, the answer is going to be in the Word, you guys. So we're going to get into the Word today. Revelation and where we have seen in the past few weeks, the Apostle Paul told us first, he said, you stir it up, you stir yourself up. Then we heard the Apostle Peter say, I'm going to stir you up. Well, today we see Jesus himself has some words for some people who need some stirring. So Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 2. I know your works, says Jesus, your toil and your patient endurance. So this word is for somebody today. He says, I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance. 
and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. What a compliment here from the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is saying, I I see all these things. And they're amazing. He's complimenting. He says, all this is good. Look, I see how you've been so strong walking this out. I see how you've not grown weary. I see what you've endured for the sake of the gospel, the things you've gone through for the sake of the kingdom. You even don't want to deal with these people who are pushing false doctrine and heresy and you're standing up for the right things. And he's coming and he's saying, look, I approve of this. I'm counting it as good. I need you to know today that God sees you. He sees you. He's saying, look, I see all those things you've done. I see the things you've given up. I see the things you suffer through for my name. I know it all. I see it and I care. And it matters to me. Because God is a God who sees He says, all this is so good and I've seen it and I see you and I appreciate it and all these things are awesome, but verse four, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. That you have abandoned or forsaken or given up the love you had at first. Another version reads, you have left your first love. Jesus has a serious issue here he wants to address. He says, look, you've been doing all the work. You've been holding right doctrine in the midst of people who are pushing things that are not true. You're standing up for the right things, but somewhere along the way, you've lost your love for me. This love that you had at first. And he says, look, I do have this against you. And it's something that needs to be addressed. It seems to me by this point, these Christians that he's saying these things to have gone well past a summer slump, if you will. (laughs) Maybe it started as a slump. Maybe it started as just, you know, a bad day or a bad Week. It might have started out as this spiritual rut they found themselves in, but one week turned into two, which turned into four, which turned into a few months, which turned into several months, which turned into a few years. And now this rut that I found myself in so long ago, I look up and I'm still here and it's just normal now. It's how I function now. It's just what I do. It's how I live and I don't know what to do to get out of this, and yeah, I have this history of doing things for Jesus. I have this track record of performing or doing good works, but somewhere the love has been lost. Most of you guys in here know uh, Heather Heron. Heather's sitting right here. Give it up for Heather Heron, everybody. If you don't know Heather, you should know Heather. Heather is a a lady who calls Blueprint Church her home and just recently gave her life to Jesus. After about 40 years or so of running from the Lord and hearing about who he was but choosing to live as an atheist, she decided to wholly and fully give her life to Jesus just earlier this year. I mean, come on. It's an amazing story. Her testimony, if you want to hear it, It will speak to you. It is so good. She's been through what so many of you in this room, so many of you watching have lived through. But she's now totally surrendered her life to Jesus. Many of you were here when we saw her get baptized a few months back. And ever since she has given her life to Jesus earlier this year, the profound things that he has done in her life and the effect that it has had on her lives and the life of those around her has been mind-blowing, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's watching one of these testimonies. It's just so good. Like, she's putting Jesus 
first in her marriage now, in her life now. She quit her job and got another one because it conflicted with consistently being in church on Sundays and in grow group on Wednesday night. She started moving things around because she knew that the Lord was showing her to do things. And she said, well, if this is what he's saying to do, I guess I'll do it. Why? Well, because he is my savior now, my Lord, and I submit all of my life to him. I've seen these things happen even over the past few months. So profound. But about a month ago, she had a text she sent to me. We had a conversation and I asked her if I could share this. She said, absolutely. Anything in my story that would witness to somebody else. So I share this with you only because she gave me permission. She sent me this text right here on my phone about a month ago. And she said, I'm struggling to feel close to God here lately. I'm struggling to pray. I haven't been reading the Bible in the past several days. I don't know why. I don't want to feel this way. I feel like I should cling to God closer during times like this because at this moment, her husband Matt was in the midst of some very, very, very serious, potentially life-threatening health issues. She says, I feel like I should cling to God closer right now, but I'm struggling to do that. And I don't know why. Any advice or scripture to read that you would recommend? This was the first time in her walk with Jesus she didn't have that push. This is when she didn't have that initial excitement, that easy urge that just was there at first. Heather was starting to get in a rut. She was starting to get into what so many of us have fell into before. And she was starting to do what so many of us do before when we start to get there. And she's starting to let go of intimacy with the Lord. She was starting to let go of spiritual disciplines that come so easy when we feel it. But she wasn't feeling it anymore. And she said, I'm not feeling like praying. I don't feel like reading the word. I don't know why. It feels like I should want the Lord more right now, but I just don't want to. I don't. Feel it. No? You ever been there? Are you there right now? Not that we want to be there. Not that maybe even we thought we would ever be there, but here we are in the midst of it, and now we don't know how to get out. See, Heather experienced what so many of us experience, but what she did is something many of us do not do. She got honest about it. She reached out to somebody and said, this is honestly where I'm at. And this is not the right Christian answer to give, but I don't even want to pray. I don't want to read the word. I have no desire. I think I should have the desire, but I don't. And I don't know what to do. And in that moment, she made herself open. She made herself vulnerable. And she opened herself up to somebody else and saying, what should I do right now? So you know what I did? I, I empathized with her. I said, you know what? I've been there. I've been there too. And it's not always going to be roses and rainbows. It's not daisies. Like sometimes the feelings aren't there. Sometimes, like, in our walk with Jesus, as we walk longer and longer, I was like, I know this is new right now, and this might be the first time you felt this, but as you walk with Jesus, many of us don't always feel it. We lose the initial, man, this is great and awesome, you know? It's not there every season. It's not there every moment. Sometimes, man, you're going to feel the tangible presence of God so real and there'll be a whole other season where it feels like you're just going through motions and you're just doing it out of obedience. And I encourage her, I said, I encourage you to just push through. Don't give up. Push through it. I'm going to take, keep praying anyway. Keep reading the word anyway. You might not feel it. You might even be like, why am I doing this? Why am I reading this? And it won't be until months later, the Holy Spirit in that moment pulls something back. Oh, that's why I needed that. 
I read that months ago. It might not feel like it's for me right now in this moment today, but it's for you. It's God's word for you. It's always good. It's always profitable. It's always good. And you know what she did? She pushed through. She kept praying. She kept reading. In fact, just about two weeks ago, she finished reading the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. All the way through. I mean, that's worth something right there. It shows you that new believer gave your life to Jesus a long time ago. What she feels is not so much different from what you felt. What she experienced is not so much different from what we've experienced. Now, what she did was a little different than what many of us do. She addressed the issue. She got really open. She got really honest and then invited someone into it. How can I do better? How, how can this change? What advice would you give me? And then she did the advice. She listened and pushed through. Oh my gosh. Man. She addressed that issue. And she pushed through. And if you find yourself in a rut today, I just want to use Heather and her story because she's letting me use it so graciously as an encouragement. You don't have to stay in that rut. If you're in the rut, you can get out. You can get out. You don't have to stay there. You can plow through. If you find yourself there today and it feels like it's become a black hole because it's been so long, it feels like that rut turned into a sinkhole, you know? Anybody ever been there? Anybody want to get honest? That's the first step if you want to address it. If you feel like you're just looking up and there's nothing but abyss around you, I want to encourage you, you can get out of the rut. Here's Jesus' words, man. He's coming up right next in the next verse. In verse 5, he says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. He says, here's the solution. Here's, I want, here's how I want you to address the issue that's in front of us. He spells it out. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent. Do the works you did at first. Remember from where you've fallen. Repent. Do the works you did at first. This is Jesus' prescription for addressing what maybe started out as a spiritual rut, but now has become so much deeper. Remember, repent, do the works. Jesus' words. He says, first, remember. He says, remember from where you have fallen. Do you remember what it was like when you first gave your life to Jesus? Do you remember what it was like? Think back. That's what this word means. Think back, consider, bring to mind. Remember what it was like when you first felt his love. When you first realized that he is God, that he is who he says he is. Remember what it was like when you first realized, oh my gosh, I can't do this on my own. I need a savior because I am hopelessly a sinner I have no hope without him. Do you remember what it was like when you felt washed clean of your sins for the first time? That you were good now? Think back. Remember. What was it like when you first experienced that love of Jesus Christ? When you first experienced it. What was your love like? What was your time with Jesus like then? When you first came into a relationship with the Lord. What was it like? Were, were, were you making a lot of time for prayer? Were you making a lot of time in the Word just because you wanted to? Like, what was it like? Was it passionate? Was it real? Was it vibrant? What was it like? We're going to do something just a little bit different here for the next 10 minutes. I want us to take a few moments to just remember. Remember. Jesus says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember the heights from which you have fallen to now arrive in this place. I want you to take a few minutes to remember. 
And what we're going to do is we're actually going to get in very, very small groups, two or three people, and I want you to actually share what it was like when you first gave your life to Jesus. What was it like when you first felt his love? What were you doing? What was your life like right afterwards? How did you start constructing your life because you were so in love with this Savior who gave himself for you? So we're going to get in groups, just two or three. We don't need a life story. That's for later. I highly encourage you to do life story later. Two to three minute version of when I gave my life to Jesus, this is what it was like. This is what I was doing. This is how I was engaged with the Lord. So if you don't know Jesus yet and you're here and you're exploring, feel free to share that honestly. But I just encourage you guys, take a few moments. In about 10 minutes, I'm gonna jump right back up here and we're gonna keep going. But I want you to share what it was like when you gave your life to Jesus. So good. What the Lord does when that love is so fresh We've just stepped into that relationship, man. It's so, there's nothing like it, right? There's really nothing like it to be walking with the Lord, hearing some of the things you guys are saying, just, it's so encouraging. So if you wanna reflect more this week, highly encourage you to. Like Jesus says, remember, you know, there's something to the remembering what he's done for us in our lives. It takes us back to that place. So I encourage you this week, take some more time to remember what God's done for you and what it was like at first. He says, remember from where you've fallen. And then the next thing he says is repent. Repent. Oh, it's one of the most beautiful words in all the Bible. I love this word. Everybody say repent. Repent gets this whole ugh, connotation. It is an amazing word. Repent means that I'm not done with you. Repent means you still have a chance. You can turn this around. I'm not giving up on you yet. Jesus says repent because he says, look, I'm not turning my back on you. You can still make this better. He says, remember from where you've fallen and then repent. He says, repent now. Turn. That's what repent means. Repent means change your mind and turn. I've been doing these things. Now I'm going to do these things. I've been walking in this kind of pattern with my life. I'm going to do a 180, and now I'm going this way. This is what Jesus says. Remember from where you've fallen, and now repent. Turn back. Come back to me. Come back to your first love. What is it? Oh, the question. You know it's coming. What is it that you need to repent of? This is the mercy of God that he gives you a chance to repent. It's so good. This is not scary. This is grace. This is mercy from the Lord. What do you need to repent of? Because I don't know. This is a question for you and the Lord. What do you need to repent of? Are there sins of commission? Commission means these are things that you're doing that you should not be doing. Anything that violates God's word and his perfect standard, that's a sin of commission. It could be lying, cheating, stealing, abusing your body, having sexual relations outside of biblical marriage, gossip, slander, lust, living in greed. Anything that's in his word that you're doing that's violating that, that is a sin of commission. And it's damaging and hindering your relationship with the Lord. Or maybe it's a sin of omission. That's something you're not doing that you should be doing. Are you not living in love? Are you not serving those around you? Are you not giving God the first and highest and best in every area of your life? Because he wants it all. These are things that make our love grow cold when we don't do them. So whatever it is, these moments that we're going to take here look different than before because this is not between you and other people. This is between you and the Lord. We're going to take just a few moments here and not just talk about it, but we're going to do this. For the next few minutes, we're going to have some background music again, but this is just for you and the Lord to go to him and get honest with God and say, Lord, I need to repent of this. 
or you say, I don't really know what I need to repent of. Holy Spirit, would you show me? Would you reveal to me what I need to confess and repent and now turn towards you? This right here could be the turning moment for you to get out of this rut. It's repentance. It restores the standard. It makes things right with the Lord. So I'm going to give us four or five minutes. And this is just for us individually to go to God and repent. So good. If you need a few little more time, it's okay. Keep spending some time with the Lord. Repentance is so powerful because it puts things back right. It brings restoration, guys. Our God's so good that he offers us repentance. It's so good. So if you need a few more moments, keep pressing in. The rest of us are going to go on to the third thing that Jesus says to do. The first thing he says to remedy this situation that you find yourself in. It may be called a spiritual rut. It may be something even deeper by now. But he says, remember from where you've fallen. Repent. And then he says, do the works you did at first. Do the works you did at first. So what works did you do? when that love relationship with Jesus was fresh? What was your time with him like? What, what did you do back then? How did you serve others? Did you, did you go about doing outreach with the homeless, the lost, people that were victims of child trafficking or of tragedies? Go do it again. Did you serve others by using your gifts in a church environment? Do it again. What was your one-on-one -on -one time like with the Lord? Did you go on walks in nature while you prayed? Is that what you like to do? Do it again. Uh, did you like to just sit in worship? Uh, I know like for me, when God wrecked my life in such a good way in my early 20s, the connection of music and worship with the Lord profoundly changed me. I mean, I would just sit in hours, hours and hours of just, sitting and worshiping, sometimes with a CD. You remember those? Wasn't a tape, not, not that old, but it was a CD. And I'd, I'd have one on, or I'd pull out my guitar, and I'd just sing songs, or I'd make up my own. Like, it was these moments in worship that the Lord would speak identity over me. He would remove lies out of my heart and my head that I had bought into. Like, these were profound shaping moments for me. I don't know what it was for you. What was it you did at first? I'd go back and do them. Maybe you're saying, you know, I didn't ever have that really profound thing. Like I gave my life to Jesus. I heard some other people talking. It wasn't that big of a thing for me. I don't even know what I would do. There was no things I did at first. And that's okay. I'm going to give you some suggestions for maybe not only the other people you heard. Let's look at what the early Christians did. What did they do? At first, maybe that would be a good idea to look at. Acts chapter 2, just one verse. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see some things the early Christians did. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Maybe these things are things you'd like to do. Maybe these things are things you'd like to prioritize in your life. It could be that these things are the things that get you out of the rut, that help get you to a place that nothing's just methodical and dead anymore, but there's life that's being stirred up. Maybe when you prioritize these things that we saw early Christians doing, I mean, this is right after Pentecost, y'all. This is when 3,000 were added in a single day. This is what they did. The apostles' teaching... Fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Of the things we know of that they did, four things. Four things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. So what do these things mean? Let's, let's make it plain. The apostles' teaching, that's God's word. Somebody say, I love the word of God. That's right. If you say it enough, you might actually believe it and you might actually start loving it. Let's say it again. I love the Word of God. 
Oh, it's life for you. It will change you. And change is good. Maybe we need to say that. Change is good. Come on, everybody. Change is good? Change is good. When you change more into who Jesus has made you to be, it's a good thing. Even when it doesn't look like your family. Even when it doesn't look like the dream of who you thought you'd be. Turning more into like Jesus is, oh, that's the good way to be. Change is good. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, what this would have looked like in this time, it would have looked like a whole lot of Old Testament scripture. It would have looked like the apostles sharing what Jesus told them to do, which is much of what we read in the New Testament now. So this is literally God's word for us. Getting into God's word. These new Christians had the foundation because it was so necessary that they would foundationally be standing and built on the word of God. The same is true for us. Are you in God's word? Are you in God's word daily? If so, good job. Keep going, even if you don't feel it. If not, get there. Can't say it more plain. Get there. Daily, get in the word of God. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of resources, online, books, Whatever you can find, daily reading plans. If you're one that helps, like you need something laid out, there's so many things. There's a technique I use now called SOAP. I instituted it about a year ago. It reinvigorated my personal daily time with the Lord. If you want to hear more about it, ask me. But the point is, find something that helps you stay dedicated to the Word of God on a daily basis and do it. So you need God's Word in your life. The second thing they did was fellowship. This one's pretty self-explanatory. You know what fellowship is? Fellowship is fellowship. It's time with other believers. They would get together to worship, and they would get together to help each other follow and be obedient to the Lord's commands. It wasn't all that difficult. They literally spent time together with the fellowship. Fellowship was so central to these early Christians. Check out Hebrews 10, just two verses, 24 and 25. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another. Well, there's that word again, stir up. We already heard Paul say, you stir yourself up. We heard Peter say, I'm going to stir you up. Who's stirring you up here? Each other. Other believers. It ain't just the preacher. It ain't just you. You're supposed to stir you up. Does that make sense? Who are you stirring up now? Everybody else. Who's stirring you up? Everybody else. But it takes fellowship. It takes us stirring one another. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. This is what we're stirring each other up towards. Not neglecting to meet together. As is the habit of some. Has it become your habit? To not meet together? Has it become something over the summer perhaps that became all too easy? It's time to break the habit. If you are local and in this area, get to this church. 226 South Main Street, Goodlesville, Tennessee, 4 o'clock, Sundays, every week. Welcome our new guests, everybody. We want to see you. Come on. We want to see you here. It's time to break the habit. It's easy to sit at home. It's easy to say, I need a lake day. I need a vacation day. All those things are okay, but they fall second place to your priority to God and to other people. He is either Lord or he is not. If you've gotten in the habit, let's break it today. When we get together, this is what happens. Encouraging one another and do it all the more as you see the day drawing near. Encouragement happens when we gather with other believers. Stirring up can happen when we gather with other believers. So is church a priority in your life? Are you committed to the gathering? Is church a priority? I didn't say an item on your list. I said, is it a priority? Does it take precedence over the other things in your life? We know it by how you spend your time. Have you committed to church? It's so important. Have you committed to a group, a place outside of Sundays where you can be around other believers in the middle of the week so that you can be built up and you can build others up? Have you committed to these things? 
I mean, there's so many great groups. Rachel's got a group. Angelica's got a group. Join my group. I'd love to have you in my group. The point is, get in the group. You need fellowship with people. Because you say, I want to get stirred up. I want to get out of this rut. It's going to take something more than what you've been doing. If you want to get out of the rut, you can't keep doing the same crap and think it's going to change. It's not. It could. I won't say it's not. It could. Not the Lord. He could do anything in your life at any moment. From my experience... If you don't change some of what you're doing with the Lord and prioritize him, you will stay in the rut, you will live your life, and at the end of your life, like I've talked to so many people and it breaks my heart, I talk to 70, 80, and 90-year-olds and they look back and they regret everything they didn't do. And they look at their life, it it matters not if they're rich or poor, and they say, what did I waste my life on? I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be you. There's something so much bigger and beyond us that is eternal, When is it going to get to the top of our list, y'all? If you want God to do something drastic, you need to do something drastic. Make church a priority when it's not just the only thing going on and there's nothing better to do. Get in church. It may take taking a weeknight out of your week and instead of doing whatever you were doing that was so important, maybe it was only Netflix, but it seemed important, but do that night instead. Get in a group and be with people and talk about the Word of God and eat some good food while you're at it because that's how we do things here. Which kind of takes us to the next point. They broke bread together. Broke bread together. Come on, somebody. Who in here likes to eat? I like to eat. Turns out it's biblical to eat together. Come on. I was just needing another reason, right? It's biblical. They got together. These believers broke bread together in their homes. They would literally get together and have life, have meals, talk, hang out. And then they'd probably have communion. They would share the Lord's Supper together. They'd remember what God did for them on the cross. Gave his life, broke his body, shed his blood. I mean, have you ever done this? I mean, really, you've got together with some other Christians, had a fun night, had a meal, and then had communion together. It might stir you up. I'm saying. Number four, they prayed. Prayer was an intentional part of their life. They made prayer an intentional part of their life privately and publicly. It was both. Maybe this is a word for somebody. Your your life with the Lord is supposed to be personal, but it's not supposed to be private. Not 100%. It's supposed to be personal, but it's not 100% private. There's something corporate about this walk with the Lord that is intended for all of us. That's why we get together. We stir one another up towards good deeds. You're in a spiritual rut now. Somebody used to be, but if you're not around them, they can't tell you how to get out. Maybe you're good now. You're like, oh, I don't need to be around people now. I'm good. I'm good with the Lord. That is so selfish. Get over yourself. The body needs you. The body needs you. Now you're on fire. Get around some people and pour into them. We need you because I get down. I get in ruts. All of us do. We need you. You, they would pray. And I'll move on from prayer. I feel like prayer, we just beat it up all the time, but it's so important. Like, if you lack this intentional, intimate prayer, you're lacking intimate connection with the Lord. Why would we not want to exercise this connection we have to the one who gave us breath, gave us life? This is how we get to talk and interact with the one who knows us better than anybody. We need to pray, make it an intentional thing, And even if we just practice these four things that these early believers did, I'll submit to you, it would be really hard to stay in a rut very long. If we just read the word, we're around other believers constantly, worshiping, group, church. If we prayed, if we hung out with other Christians and made a point to break bread together, have communion, you wouldn't stay in a rut very long. Because we'd have the word pulling us out. We'd have God pulling us out. If we started to get down, there'd be other people pulling you out. You wouldn't stay in that rut too long. Why are we talking about this, Adam? You're belaboring the point. It seems like you've said this before. Well, I have, but we've not all done it yet. Y'all remember the example of Heather? That whole like mind-blowing part as a pastor, it made me so, so happy. I, I gave her godly advice, and she did it. Oh. Thank you, Heather. 
Why are we talking about this? Because I want to see us stirred up for the things of God. I want to see this real connection vertically with the Lord restored. And also this connection horizontally restored. How many people do you know that don't go to church because they're hurt by church people? How many of them think they don't need church people? How can we tell them the truth with grace and bring them back in? Look, this is a need, y'all. Satan is working overtime taking people out. I don't know when the end's going to happen, but I don't even know when it's going to happen for you. Life is but a breath. It is for your family and your friends. We can't waste time on these things. Jesus says, remember, and then repent, and then do the works that you did at first, because if we've lost sight of this first love, we've got to come back, y'all. We've got to come back. We've got to restore this love of Jesus and the love that we have for other people. Now, I've got to say this because I'm always about the truth of the text over good preaching points. I love having cool teaching points. It's fun. That was memorable little statements. But I'd rather give you the truth. So just to stay true to the text, I've got to tell you this. When we read this part in Revelation 2 and it says, you've lost the love you've had at first. Many scholars think that we're actually talking about the love that we had for one another, not necessarily Jesus. You can read it both ways. And it makes sense. If you want to go look it up, I've spent honestly hours and hours in commentary and looking at Greek and cross-referencing scriptures, and I think there's a good case to be had for both. Because in Acts chapter 20, for example, Paul tells the leaders of the Ephesian church, which is who he's talking to here, he says, go and serve some people that are in need. Then in Ephesians 1, it talks about how the Ephesians were known for their works and their love for all the saints. So like their love for each other and what they did for people was so evident. So it's very possible this is what they're talking about. So if we read it that way, the, the point of the message is whatever you did for people, when you are freshly in love with Jesus, go do those things again. You've quit doing them, go do them. Because people matter. It's not just this, it's this. Do the works you did at first. You've lost your first love. Let your love be demonstrated through what you do. It's not all here. It's not all here. It has to come out through your hands. Jesus gives this three-pronged thing. Oh man, it all comes back to discipleship. I can't wait for our series that starts in two weeks. We say a disciple is someone who follows Jesus with their head, their heart, and their hands. Somebody who makes a decision to follow Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and lives on mission with Jesus. Jesus' command here is to remember, repent, and do the works. Remember, remember what it was like. Remember where you've fallen from. Repent, change your heart, be changed, and now go do something about it. This is Jesus saying, remember the works you did at first and go do them. So which one of the two is it? Is it about Jesus? Is it about other people? It could be both. I don't know which one. There's good biblical solid case for both. So knowing that, how do we be true to the word? My suggestion is to do both. How about we love the Lord and return to him with everything in us and love people like we actually love the Lord too. Demonstrate our love for Christ, how we live for others. How about we put others above ourselves? Outdo one another, as the Bible says, in showing of honor, preferring others, doing stuff for them. Even when it's not convenient, we lay our lives down for our brother and sister. Let's do all of it. And then let's add to it what the first Christians did. You ought to go make a list. I'm going to wrap up. Give me two minutes. You ought to make a list. I'm a list guy, so forgive me. But I like making lists. Here's what you ought to do. Let me encourage you, note takers and list makers and non-list makers. Here's what you ought to do. You ought to go make a list of all the things you did at first when you were passionately in love with Jesus. Then you ought to make a list of all the things you did for other people when you were passionately in love with Jesus. And then after that, you ought to write down all the things those first believers did when they were in love with Jesus. And then make another list at the bottom of that list of all the things you know you ought to be doing as a passionate follower of Jesus. 
And then once you've got that list made, go and do them all. Do all of them. This is normally where I would say pick one and focus on it and see if the Lord stirs you up. Forget that. Make the list and do it all. Do the whole stinking list. You want something to change. You want to be fired up and stirred up for the Lord. You have got to change something. If you want all of what God has for you, you've got to give God all of you have. You're not going to experience all that the Lord has until you give him all that you have. So do something drastic. Go all in with the Lord. You holding things back has gotten you to the point you're at right now. But you want that to change. So let's do something drastic and go after the Lord. I want you to stand with me. As we close today, we are going to worship. We are going to pray. And I'm believing that the Lord is going to stir some things up as we do what he said in the word. So let's pray. And then our team is going to lead us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now as we remember where we have fallen from, as we repent, as we try to do the things we did at first, would you please restore us? Would you make us whole? Lord, bring us back to the place of passionate love for you, a place where we couldn't get enough of you, a place where we couldn't get enough of your word or of your people or of being in the house of the Lord. I remember, Lord, I literally used to say, I will scrub toilets in the house of the Lord. And then you let me. <laughs> it was a great time. If it just means serving in any way, Lord, let us show the love that you have for us to others. Would you stir us up with passion for your name's sake, Lord, for your kingdom. Would you bring us back to our first love? We want to know you more. We want you more than anything, Lord. Come and have every part of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.